who's out there. What's the matter? You have your regular phone on you? No. Can you check Facebook? Just make sure I'm live. This looks weird to me. Uh, okay. I see a couple people there. Just give people a minute to jump on. What's up, folks? Hey, Ron. How you doing, buddy? I know it's an odd time to do this, but if I don't do it now, every time I think I'm going to do it at the end of the day, I'm like, yeah, I'm done. Hey, Sarah. Thank you. Thanks for confirming. Thanks for confirming. Doing okay, buddy. Doing okay. Doing all right. You have a Rottweiler with you right now, Ron? Hey, Lane. Thanks, babe. Thank you. No, I mean at home with your current dog situation. I know you usually have a Rottweiler. It's the first time in a while where I got the bug, where I'm missing it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, definitely not, Sarah. <laughs> a little too early. Not even just, even if it was that late, it'd be no. My, um, this has been too busy of a summer. So between our traveling um, to Las Vegas and then to Florida, and then my friends from New Jersey came and then my brother-in-law and sister-in-law were here and now we're going back to Florida. No, I've, I've taken a beating this summer, but we're having a good time. We're trying, we're trying to enjoy life very much, very much, but I don't, I don't do that as often as people think. I just like to do it when I'm doing a live, but uh, if we have people around and we're doing those things, then I need a break. Need a break. The body doesn't handle it like it used to. Okay, let's get started here. I'm on for almost five minutes. And I know anytime I jump on in the middle of the day like this, there won't be a ton of people on. But that's okay, because I saved them. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the, the little things that so many people ignore and fail, especially people that have issues with their dog's behavioral problems, right? So... A video popped up today. I didn't post it today, but it's an old, it's an old video. It's like five or six years old with me and a, a German short hair pointer. I guess a lot of, you know, a lot, it had a lot of views before on Facebook, but a lot of people haven't seen it. So I was getting all kinds of comments from today um, because people have always asked me, hey, just film like nothing, like just film your regular, like when you're not really training, like, you know, formal training. And that's hard to do unless you have someone following you around with, with the camera, which I don't. So the things that are most important to me, you usually don't get to see, right? So I try to show as much of that stuff I can. And every time I do, you know, if I go sit in a client's house and record us talking and little things, that's always the stuff that people are craziest about, that they appreciate the most and that they really love, right? Because social media, the internet, it's, it, you know, dog trainers put out so much stuff every day. And, and it's a lot of the same stuff. It, it just is someone's talking about this or showing this and it's, it's just not stuff that people haven't seen. So, so they get kind of bored with it and I totally get it. And that's why I've backed off so much on posting things because I, I can't be that guy who posts stuff just to create content and doing the same shit over and over. I just can't do it. You know, I can't do it. I don't care if I lose like whatever they call the stuff where people, you know, you stay active in people's feet. I don't care. 
right? So let's talk about that. Um, when I posted that video, I thought I was going to be booed and stuff like, why are you showing this? But it was the opposite. Like people, I kind of went crazy about it. So I've talked at nauseum before how I don't teach dogs to walk nicely on a loose leash. They just do it. They just do it. Right. And that doesn't make sense to people. And it's something that people, Hey, Chrissy, it's a uh, look, Chrissy. Zaya. Um, I love these shirts, by the way, these are my favorite workout shirts. Zaya has to make them in all colors. Um, so if you have any, I'll buy them from you, Chrissy, because I don't know any Zaya reps that provide me with consistency in these shirts. Okay. Um, who was I saying? Oh, the walking. I don't teach it, right? I don't like, if I do have to focus on it at all, it's for like a very, very short period of time. Because by the time I get to that point where I need the dog to do that, they just want to be with me. They want to be next to me, right? And so with that German short hair pointer, that was a, a good example. By the time you get towards the end of the video, 15, 16, 17 minutes, what is it? You know, that dog doesn't walk nice on a loose leash. He just got here, I think, 20 minutes before I made that video, right? but I'm providing that dog different information than he's used to with the leash. Those little things are so important. And to this day, I see trainer after trainer in the pet dog world, ignoring that kind of stuff. And they're focused on come sit down place and e collars and prong collars. And you don't understand how much you're missing by not paying attention to those little things. That's why I've always said training starts before the training starts. And that was, that's a prime example, right? So you see a dog that's living in constant stress. He can't focus. He can't whine. There's just constant leaking and crying and looking around. That's not healthy, right? If you can't teach a dog to be still and to be calm next to you when there's nothing around, and you have behavioral issues in the home or outside of the home or out on your walks or reactivity or aggression, all these problems, how are you supposed to fix those difficult issues if you can't create a stable dog when there's nothing around? But people are taking dogs with issues, let's say that can't go on a walk without freaking out when it sees a dog, and they're trying to put the dog in that situation and then fix the problem it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. So that video that everyone was commenting on today, that's a prime example of how we start. Now I would spend the next couple of weeks building that dog up and doing the training at my home and not really traveling out because then by the time we travel out and those issues arise, then I could tell a dog, hey, buddy, you don't need to worry about that. And he gets it because we already have that built in. But so many people do the opposite, right? Um, so the walking on a loose leash, thing, it's, it should never be an issue. That's a five, 10 minute fix for any dog without e-collars, without prong collars. It's so simple. I think the video on YouTube that has the most views of mine, I think it's like 2 million views. It's the one where I broke down this is very easy. This will work for any dog, how to teach any dog to walk nicely. And it was a, a, a Doberman. And I break down the different things that you could do to change that instantly. And the best thing is I got so many nasty comments on how about not using a trained dog to show us this. And I, that's great. I love that. To me, that's the ultimate compliment because here's the thing that wasn't a trained dog. That's a dog that couldn't walk nicely on a loose leash, but because it looked so easy, people think the dog is trained and that's good. That's, that's what you want. Right. But it truly is that easy. So like, if you ask my people that come to my group classes who can't walk their dog without the dog pulling them, they'll tell you, it takes me five minutes, five minutes. And the dog's going to walk with me. Why? It's the things I do up until that point with the leash, right? It's very, very important. And people aren't paying attention to that. So let's go through some examples. Um, you know what? I'll touch on some different things. I'm getting ready to start a new client and I'm really excited, very excited about this dog. Um, and technically I didn't have room for them, 
because I'm booked up. And the people who sent me messages that you want those spots that I had open for the privates, yes, I got them and I will get back to you, I promise. And we'll get started soon. But when I talked to this lady, um, I didn't have room for her, board and train or privates. But there were a few things that said, okay, I'm going to take you on. Hey, Ara, how you doing, buddy? Anytime, my friend. And um, I sent you a text a little earlier. I don't know if you saw it. So when I'm talking to this lady, she tells me she's got this, this, this dog that has been through several trainers to no avail. The problem hasn't been fixed. Like many trainers, this lady has spent a fortune. And uh, it's insanely goes insane when it sees a dog out on a walk, I guess. All right. Just out of control. And no one's been able to, to help her with this. And some of the things that were done to the dog, it's not only useless, but very detrimental to the dog. And, and she was bright enough, bright enough to, uh, to realize that. Now, with that being said, there is one trainer who's actually a friend of mine and a very good trainer that dealt with the dog and hey Trey how are you buddy and gave it back to her and said I'm not the trainer for this issue okay this isn't something that that I could deal with or want to deal with that right there is someone that I will send clients to all the time because see all the other trainers yeah we'll fix it send us the dog we're going to charge you a bunch of money we're going to do a three week board and train and then the problem's not fixed. So we're going to need another three weeks and we're going to keep charging you and this and that and it keeps going. And then this trainer does this to fix that. And this trainer does this. But this trainer, who's a friend of mine in Nashville, said, I'm not the person to fix this problem. That's the kind of trainer that you want. Someone that's honest and knows I'm very good with this stuff and this is what I like working with. But this isn't me. I don't like it. I can't help you find someone else. That's someone that's not just there to take your money. So kudos to you, my friend. If you see this, you know who you are. Okay. That's really important, guys. So let's let's give a little feedback on the dog, right? Uh, individual has four dogs. This is a very, very high drive dog, right? Very high drive dog. Doesn't have issues with their own dog. Um, and so... When I talk to this individual on the phone, I don't just say, what's the problem? Okay, yeah, I'll get you signed up. I'll start here. No, we talk for a while on the phone because I need to understand this person. I want the background and I'm going to be able to tell a lot about the individual from the conversation, the things they say voluntarily, the things they say when I ask questions matters. It's so important, right? So one of the things they told me they're involved in rescue. So this was a dog that was rescued or adopted or whatever you guys want to call it. Right. They did a ton of on leash socialization with other dogs when the dog was younger. Lots of on leash meeting every dog possible. OK, that's one no, no. All right. We're going to break this down. Lots of on leash things. Now, this is a genetically a genetically gifted dog that is bred to do two high energy herding breeds mixed together two breeds that have a history of biting people and causing difficulties inside the home mixed together okay so i said okay i said when i saw what the mix was i said why <laughs> why did you get this and that's when she explained about the rescue thing Okay, so now another reason why I took this person on is because she said the thing I love to hear. She said, I had no idea you were this close to me. I'm so excited. I will do anything you tell me to do. You want me at your house at 4 a.m., I will be there at 4 a.m. Tell me what to do and I'll do it. That's all I need to hear. Hey, Terry, that's all I need to hear. I'm like, okay, this is, this is pretty cool, right? So then they talk about they do work a lot with the dog. I say, okay, well, tell me, how do you mean you work with the dog? And they go through all the little things they do. The dog has to, you know, wait to eat. The dog has to wait at the door. You know, we 
play different games. We do this, we do that. We're always working with the dog. I said, okay. I said, but out of all those things, none of them fulfill the genetic makeup of this dog. Actually, it's quite boring stuff. And for many dogs, this would be great stuff, right? But we're not paying attention to what the dog is genetically. I said, tell me more. She said, okay. Um, well, they got very excited about, about, and mind you, this is a, an outstanding owner. Fantastic. And I can't wait to meet her in person. Like these are the kind of people I love to work with. Um, so she says they're teaching the dog different buttons, I guess with different words or something. And there's one button when the dog pushes, the dog gets let out. So the dog knows how to push a button to be let out. There's another button. The dog pushes to know how to get a treat and so on and so on. And they were very excited about this. I said, okay, well, that's terrible. That's wrong. Their heart's in the right place and they're working hard, but that's not the route we want to take, right? When the dog sees a dog, the first thing it does, it explodes. It goes crazy. It doesn't stop. It grabs the leash and it tugs and fights and bites on the leash. Okay. Now, a lot of people are going to try to punish that, correct that, redirect that. What is the dog telling you? Okay. The dog is telling you that for a long time, you would go find every dog you can, allow your dog to pull you over there and meet these dogs, right? And it did great. It loved meeting other dogs. Now you're telling me that you're teaching the dog to push buttons for you to do this, for you to do that, for you to do that, for you to do this, right? So for a long time, that dog said, ah, there's a dog, let's go. And you follow your dog and your dog gets to meet and greet the dog. Now your dog's telling you, hey, I pushed this button, give me something to eat. Hey, I pushed this button. Hey, you get up, get off your ass, let me out, right? That's what the dog's telling you. The dog's grabbing the leash and shaking and biting, and it's trying to tell you something. I am frustrated because for so long, you let me do anything I want to do. I tell you to go over there, you take me over there. I press this button, you give me food. I press this button, you let me out. Now, all of a sudden, when I see a dog, you're not letting me go over there. Now I'm pissed. Why all of a sudden can I do what I want, right? So the frustration goes through the roof. And that's where the behavioral problems come in. That's when you can't walk your dog because now when it sees a dog, it's like, why? Why all of a sudden can't I do what I want when you're doing everything I tell you to do otherwise up until this point in my life, right? These are problems. So when I said, what are we doing to fulfill the genetic makeup of this dog? And she went through all the things. She's working very hard. Fantastic owner. Just putting her efforts in the wrong place. And the exercises and training that they're doing is literally making the dog more frustrated because it's not enough. Right? Oh, you want to bite the leash and pull it and fight? Not a problem. Now we're not going to go on walks. We're going to spend that time playing games that make sense to you. Right? Now we're going to not use the leash. Now we're going to use the tug. Now we're going to use the ball. And we're going to teach you how to do things because you're a Malinois and Australian cattle dog mix. Likes to chase things, likes to bite things, right? Well, we can't let them chase and bite things, but we could structure that into our training, into our play. And now we could fulfill that dog. And during that game, that training, that playing, there's a lot of rules and boundaries that you have to abide by, right? You have to understand yes, but you have to understand no also. You have to understand neutrality, right? When I say don't touch that toy that's on the floor, you can't touch it. Now I'm the one telling you what to do. We're a team. We're a team. You're going to love this game. We don't care about the toy, but you're going to love this game. But I am the captain of that team, right? And then when we go out and venture out into the real world, yeah, we're still a team. You're my boy, but I'm still the captain of that team. 
And the dog has to be able to look at you and understand that you can control all that stuff. But up until this point, the control, the dog has controlled everything. Okay. Has controlled everything. All right. So, you know, for years I got asked about my dogs. How did you train this? How did you train that? Listen, my first dog, me and my wife destroyed like a lot of people do. We made it so weak mentally because that was our baby. We did everything wrong. We coddled that dog. We loved on that dog. I threw a Frisbee for that dog, but there were no rules and boundaries with that dog. We gave it everything it wanted. We took it to meet every old people living in our, all the old people, the snowbirds that came down from up north when we lived in Arizona, Arizona, loved meeting Ben every day. And we'd take him everywhere and he'd be loved on like crazy. You know, he would disappear out of our apartment and I couldn't find him. I'd have to knock on my neighbor's door and the old people would be rolling around on the floor playing with him. We'd leave the house. He'd be screaming bloody murder. So I didn't put him in the crate. I'd leave him loose and barricade him in the kitchen. Then I'd come home. One day I come home. The gate is down from the kitchen and there's little white footprints all over our apartment. And I'm like, what the hell? And then all of a sudden I look up and here comes Ben. He was all black, jet black. He comes out of my room looking at me like this. And all I could see is his eyes. He was covered in white powder. I had a big box of, you guys know what metrics is, like the meal replacement stuff. This was perfect RX vanilla. I had a whole case in my room. He ripped apart the whole case. There was protein powder everywhere. He was covered in head to toe. We destroyed him, destroyed him, right? He struggled his whole life. When we'd go on vacation and we'd board him and our first Rottweiler together, the Rottweiler thrived. Ben suffered because he couldn't be away from us. We created that. He wasn't born like that. You understand? Then when we got our first Rottweiler, the vets scared the bejesus out of me. We were in Arizona and said, don't take this dog anywhere till he's a year old because Parvo is so bad. So guess what? I didn't take the dog anywhere till he was a year old. And by now I'm learning more because I'm working with the trainer with my first dog and I'm obsessed with the behavior. Right. So a year later, me and my buddy, John, who also worked for the Border Patrol, he had a boxer. Cyrus, our first Rottweiler, was a year old. I said, now I could take him out. I said, hey, John, let's get the dogs to meet today. Right. So John says, yeah, that's a good idea. I said, all right, see you in a little while. So I go out. We're going to meet halfway. I'm walking Cyrus. I see my buddy John coming for, for, with his dog and we're coming together. Again, totally wrong. And our dogs meet on leash. And Cyrus, my Rottweiler, is looking at this dog like, what am I supposed to do here? Totally confused because he had lived in my backyard, in my house this whole time. Never been exposed to nothing, right? And the boxer's looking like, hey, maybe we should play or do something. I don't know what to do. And we're just standing there. What are they going to do? And then the boxer took his paw and he went, boop hit Cyrus in the head wanting to play. And Cyrus said, Cyrus said, oh, screw that. Snapped the dog up and flipped him over on his back because he didn't know how to react. And now my Rottweiler's on top of my buddy John's um, boxer. He's not hurting him, but he's not letting him go. And their collars got tangled up. And I'm yelling, John, help me get these dogs apart. He's like, I'm not getting in there. <laughs> so here I am trying to get these dogs apart, right? So I made all these mistakes. But every dog I got, I learned more and more and more. And I saw the value and how, how important all these little things were. Now, when I first started getting recognized in dog training, a big part of that was because of Bruno, my Rottweiler, who was a superstar. He was an incredible dog. And he traveled with me all over the country. And every place I went, people would say, how did you train this dog to be like this? Like he was just incredible. No one was ever scared of him, even though he's a Rottweiler. Because the look on his face was always soft and happy, and he would meet people everywhere. And he loved everybody. He loved going to the vet. They could stick thermometers in his butthole. They could stick needles in him. And he didn't care because he was getting to interact with people. And that's what he loved. But guess what? Bruno was the worst puppy we ever had. He was a nightmare. He was an absolute terror. He was a nightmare. He was one of 13 puppies. 12 of those puppies, the 12 other puppies were all put down by the time they were a year old, all put down, right? Little background on that. I had looked for a Rottweiler that I wanted for a long time. Couldn't find what I wanted. Then one day there's a young guy in Eastern Kentucky. Anyone knows 
who what Eastern Kentucky is like, think of deliverance, right? So me and Stephanie drive several hours to go look at this litter of 13 puppies. We pull up in front of the house and there's a female, the mama is sitting on the porch. She looks at us, no bullshit. She opens the front door to the house, runs inside, comes back out with a toy to come say hello to us. I was like, oh my God, this dog is incredible, right? So we already know the stability of the mom and the social aspect of the mom is beautiful, but she was sucked dry from 13 puppies. I wanted to see the dad. I had only seen pictures of him and the guy was very honest. He goes, look, this is my first breeding. I'm just trying to get into this. He goes, I can't bring the dad here because he's out of control. Like he's out of control. He wants to chase everything. He wants to go after the cows. Like he's a lunatic and it's okay. Well, I appreciate the honesty, but I want that kind of energy and drive, right? Said, is is he aggressive towards people? He goes, no, people think he is because he's so out of control and intense, but no. I said, okay. Well, the guy was honest with everything else, so I believed him. So out of the 13 puppies, I looked at what everybody was doing. We spent some time there, and we picked Bruno. We took Bruno home, and right from the start, he was a lot. He was, he was just so much. He was nuts, right? But by now, I knew how to train a dog. I knew a lot. So Bruno spent a lot of time in his crate because when he came out of his crate, he couldn't be loose in the house at all, at all, because he would just rip down the blinds. He would rip the couch. Up. He was nuts. So when he came out of his crate, me and him would go outside and we would do cool things together out there, right? He didn't get tired. So then when we came in, it was back in the crate. He can't have any freedom at this point because he can't handle it. If I give him freedom at that point, as bad as he was, then I'm just creating a negative relationship with him because I'm going to have to yell at him and stop him and correct him for everything. Right? So until he could handle that freedom, he can't have it in the house. It's only outside where he could be himself. Well, as he was getting a little bit older, you know, a few months old, it wasn't getting better. It was getting worse, but I put in the work. Um, Stephanie was pregnant with Sophia and I got called away to go back to the academy. I had to go away for training for six months. So now I have, I think Bruno was like seven or eight months old or nine months old. And Sophia was born. We have a newborn baby. It was insane. It was a lot. Like he was bad. I remember once my mother-in-law visiting and Bruno was in the yard and he would look in, in the, in the glass door in the back and look at you like this. And she said, my mother said, oh, he's so cute. So she went outside. She came in like within a minute or two and had this heart look of horror on her. I said, did he get you? And she was like, no, no, he's fine. But I know that she went out there and he just like mauled her. He was a lunatic. One time Stephanie left him in the yard and ran in town. She was gone like 10, 15 minutes. When she got back, and by the way, I don't ever leave my dogs alone. When she got back, but she thought she was doing something good for him instead of having him in the crate. When she got back 15, 20 minutes later, he had gotten the grill off of the cover, put a hole in it, and had it wrapped around his neck, choking himself out. So thank God she came home when she did or he'd be dead. Right. When I got called away, I thought I was going to have to give that dog away. I said, Stephanie, I can't leave you here with a newborn baby and this dog. I can't do it. And our other dog. I said, I can't. We have to find a home for him. She said, no, I'm going to do it. So every day, my wife would put Sophia in the jogging stroller, put Ben on one side, Bruno on the other side of the stroller. She'd put a backpack on him with five pounds of rice on this side, five pounds of rice on that side. And she would run with Sophia and the dogs to drain his energy just enough that she could handle him. And she did that the whole six months I was gone. And because we didn't give Bruno the freedom that he couldn't handle, together as a family, we created which was just, yeah, Ron, you you met Bruno, beautiful ambassador for the breed, just the greatest dog you'll ever meet. He had no behavioral problems. 
and he was the only one who lived out of his litter because we focused on the little things, right? The little things are so important, guys. I can't stress it enough. Okay. Let's, um, let's talk about my dad's dog bear, the German shepherd that I had for five years. Okay. Um, and I've talked about this before, but for people just tuning in to me, it's important that you understand this. So my dad got this German shepherd puppy grew to be a very, very large shepherd. And my dad loved this dog, right? Loved this dog, like mad about him. But my dad was a terrible dog owner because again, he let the dog do whatever he wanted always. You know, my dad would cook that dog steaks. They'd hang out in the yard every night and he'd make a steak for him or a burger for him and a burger for the dog. And that's how they lived. And it got to be one point where my dad was like, you know, I'm sick of this dog. I can't even take him for a walk without him wanting to kill everything. And I was getting ready to go home to visit. And I said, I'll fix it when I come home. He's like, yeah, it's not going to happen. Trust me. I said, I'll fix it when I get there. Right. So we go home. And I tell my dad, come on, we're going to take Bear for a walk. I'm going to fix this for you right now. I said, but you have to stay behind. You're not walking with us. You can watch from behind. He said, okay. So I put Bear, he had a choke collar on. That's what my dad had with him. We get ready to leave the house and he goes to explode through the door. And I stopped that shit right there. I said, no, it's not going to happen. See, the second you take that leash, that dog knows whether you're full of shit or not. That dog knows if it's going to do what it usually does. But I told him different without saying anything. That leash told him there's someone new at the end of this leash. And all of a sudden, I'm not allowed to do what I normally do. So we started heading out on the walk. And the first thing we encountered was my dad lived on a very busy street in Lodi, New Jersey. There was a car parked on the side of the road, very busy road, and there were two guys working on the hood was up, one was under, one was over, and they're working on this car. And I look back at my father, and he goes, oh, yeah, wait, you're going to see now. You know, that's what he's trying to tell me. We walked by the people very slow. The dog didn't even care that they were there, right? I look back at my father. He's like, you know, he's all disgusted. We continue. We went on a long walk. We're passing dogs in the yard. We're passing people. Nothing. My father is very disgusted at this point because now he sounds like a liar. So finally, I stop. My father comes with us and he's like, I don't understand this. Like, what, you know, what the fuck? You know, why is he not doing this? And and I explained to him. Then we see a young lady with a pit bull across the street. Young pit bull. I say, do me a favor. Go over. And Bear was bad with dogs. Really bad. I said, go over there and ask her. If we can come over and just bullshit with her and sit there with Bear since you got the day. He's like, oh, no, he can't. That's we can't do that. I said, just trust me. And he goes over and he says, yeah, he waves us over and we go and we're just talking to her and the dog's just sitting there. Right. My father's like bewildered at this time. But all he did was with almost all everyday average dog owners do. And so when the average dog owner goes online and sees all these dog trainers on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube, and they're just talking about the same shit and just put the e-collar on and do this and the pro, it helps nobody because no one is focusing on the little things with the average dog owner, which makes up the majority of dog owners in the world. And so dog trainers want to market to each other and look cool and look sexy And so many of them are focused on getting bigger and not better. And the ones that are truly focused on getting bigger never get better. They remain shitty dog trainers and they help no one, but they make a lot of money and their channel grows. And so for me, it's always been very, very important to try to help the average dog owner that's suffering. And that's why all the shit still goes out for free. And I don't put out as much as I used to because I've talked about everything at nauseum, right? Now, let's fast forward a few years. My dad's dying of lung cancer. We know he's going to die and he's young. He's 57 years old. That's less than seven years older than me. He was really worried about what's going to happen to bear his dog because he can't, you know, my mom can't handle that dog. And I told my dad, I said, I will take the dog. I promise you. Don't worry about the dog. I'm going to take the dog. I think my dad thought I was full of shit because we had four other dogs and three other dogs. Bear doesn't do well with other dogs. He'll be fine. So my dad dies. We go to New Jersey. We do all that stuff. And 
we come back with Bear. Our first training with Bear. We stop in West Virginia to spend the night on the way home. And we're with Bear. I got a dog-friendly hotel. And it's like a shitty motel. It's all we could find. And we're on the second floor outside. Now, I have to go up, you know, the metal steps with there's they're wide open. I have to go up there to our room. Well, I quickly found out that Bear doesn't do stairs. And Bear definitely doesn't do metal stairs with nothing behind it. Well, guess what? Bear has to. So now I have to get this dog to trust me enough that you're going to come with me and you don't have a, an option. There's no food involved. There's no e-collars involved. I'm not going to beg you and baby talk. Hey, buddy. Now, remember back to all the things we did on the walk and where you had to follow me. It didn't matter. It's the same thing now, Bear. You could trust me. I'm going to take you to the top and don't worry. Well, that took less than five minutes to get him up the stairs and he did it. Thank God he was with us because there was some shit going on outside our door all night and Bear laid by the door and just growled. Now we get home. Okay, we get home. It's the following day. Stephanie goes in. Hey, Daniel. Stephanie goes in and I know what's going to happen when the dogs come out. But see, Bear's not going to be separated from our family. He's going to be part of our pack day one. Day one. I get Bear out. He's on leash. I start walking away from my home and I tell Stephanie, let the dogs out. All three dogs come running out to greet him and he explodes as I knew he would. I just kept walking. I stopped him with the leash. I stopped the behavior I didn't want. I didn't say anything. I didn't make a big deal about it, but I did not allow him to do what he wanted to do. As a matter of fact, I just kept moving. Now you have no choice but to follow me, Bear. And all three dogs are kind of walking with us and they come in again to try to greet and he explodes again and I stop it and we just keep walking. Now, by the time I got through my whole neighborhood, it used to take about 20 minutes. We get back to the house. I take the leash off and I let him go and he's running around with the other dogs. Okay. I establish right from the start, you don't have the right to do that. Okay. This is me. I make the rules. Not Bruno, not Karma, not Ben, me. There's no dog in charge. I'm in charge. And you can't be in charge, Bear. You have to trust me, right? Now, he's running around, but there's tension between him and Bruno right from the start. Because as social as Bruno was with other dogs, if you're going to be an asshole, Bruno is not going to tolerate that around his family. And so there's tension right from the start. They didn't do anything because Bruno's never going to do anything he's not allowed to do but there's tension. So after a while, we go in the house. We walk in through my garage, our old house, which leads right to the kitchen. As soon as we go in the house, Bear finds a corner in the kitchen and lays down, right? Just lay down in the corner. Nothing can come in behind him. He feels safe there. He sees the house. This is a big change for him now, right? As me and Bruno are walking through the kitchen. Bruno's at my side. Bruno looks over at Bear like this, and I exploded on Bruno. I went ape shit. I made him believe like he was going to die, like he just saw Jesus himself. Why did I do that? I can't say, oh, Bruno, don't do that. That's Bear. That's your new brother. Your guy's going to be besties. No, but that's what people want to do. They want to treat their dog like they're a handicapped child. And we continue to fuck up dog after dog after dog because people are selfish and they care about their own needs instead of the needs of the animal. So why did I explode on Bruno right there? Very simple. Bruno has to understand that behavior is unacceptable and will not be tolerated. Okay. The only one that could do that is me, my wife, my kids. You as the dog cannot give me that behavior. More importantly, Bear, the dog that doesn't like other dogs or strange people, has to see that, Bear, you don't have to worry about nothing. I will take care of you. Okay? I will take care of you. I'll take care of everything around here. You don't have to worry about this shit. Okay? Now, to the day Bear died, we had him, I think, five years. Bear and Bruno never got into a squabble. 
They never liked each other. They never got into a fight, but they never liked each other. Okay. I can leave them in the yard alone. Give them each a bone. Give them each a raw bone. One would lay here. One would lay here. Bruno would look this way. Bear would look this way. But they never, ever had a fight. You know why? There's nothing to fight over. There's no trying to establish who's dominant there. Because they could bullshit each other all they want. But in reality, they know the people inside the home are the ones in charge. And so they don't have to take that stress in working things out on their own. Very healthy for dogs. Okay. Now let's move on to another dog. Simple. Things that you people see every day. My friend Sue. Hi, Sue, if you see this. Sue and Ellen come to my current group classes. They started in January coming. They travel from several hours away and come to just about every group class. Two wonderful, wonderful ladies. Like, just fantastic. Love them both to death. They put in the work. So the first time I met Sue, her and her husband came to the first group class. They had two doodles, right? I'm walking around. I kind of walk past Sue and her husband. I say, hey, guys. And the doodle explodes, shows his teeth, comes forward like he's going to come after me. And they got really upset and they're trying to stop it. I said, oh, is that a fact? Did I say, okay, turn up the e-collar? Yank the prong collar. Do this. I said, no. I said, oh, really? Okay. Give me the dog. And I walked over and I took the leash. I didn't hold the grudge. I didn't start hanging the dog. I didn't choke the dog. I didn't hit the dog over the head with anything. I took the dog and I removed him from Sue and her husband. And I took him out in the middle. And I said, what's up, buddy? And he was like, oh, shit. What, what do I do now? What do I do now? Because this always works. When I do this, whoever I do this to backs up or mom backs up. What do I do now? And that dog literally sat there like, oh, shit. I didn't do anything but stand there and talk to everyone. But when that dog tried to walk away, no, no, no. I brought him back to me. Now you can't leave. One of the greatest movie scenes of all time, Bronx Tale. When the bikers walk into Sonny's bar and they sit down and he tells them, hey, I know your reputation. You guys like to tear things up and fight. And the biker says, no, sir, we're just here to have a drink. He says, OK, well, you're welcome here as long as you behave like that. Right. And then after a while, the bikers start. They take a drink. They throw the bottle. They break it. And now they start fighting and they're destroying the bar. And Sonny walks out from the back. And the bikers are all doing their thing. And he walks over to the door. And he locks the door and the bikers just stop. And Sonny says, now you can't leave. That's powerful, right? That's powerful. Same thing with Sue's doodle. He's like, I got to get over that. No, buddy. Now you can't leave. You wanted to hurt me. At least you acted like you did, right? But I knew he did it. I knew it was just a bluff. And she's done wonderful with him. She's worked so hard and like he, she's done so fantastic. He's like a different dog, different dog, right? Like really fantastic. Now let's go fast forward. I think Sue was going on vacation or something. And she was, her grandkids were coming over. And so Sue did everything right. She didn't let the grandkids, you know, do things to the dog that it wouldn't like. In fact, she got them involved and would throw a ball for him and taught them how to play in a safe way where she controlled everything. But here's the problem. Um, she sent me a message and she was a little upset because at one point the family, and I may have this a little wrong, Sue, but it's, I know I got most of it here. You know, our family was like, you know what? We've been here a while now. He's doing so good. Like he's so great with us. We're so happy. We love him. Now we just want to pet him. So now when they come close, all of a sudden in a different way, he growls just a little bit. Didn't do what he did to me. He growled just a little bit. And Sue got upset. And I told her, I said, Sue, don't get upset at all. Don't get upset at all. First of all, be happy that the dog was letting you know, hey, mom, I've been working really hard. But this is making me very uncomfortable again. 
That's what the dog's telling you, right? So this is the way I explained it to Sue. Imagine you have a friend who's an alcoholic, like really struggling, really struggling bad, just a blatant alcoholic. And he decides to get clean. And he goes a whole year, doesn't have a drink. He's working so hard. He's doing great. His family is happy. Everyone is happy. And everyone is doing what they can to help him stay clean, right? And then it's one year. And you want to celebrate because it's the one year anniversary and you want to take him to a bar to celebrate. That's what you do to the dog when you put the dog in that situation, right? So the dog has worked so hard for you. You've worked so hard for him. You've put in the time and the effort and the dog's comfortable now doing things with people and he's not exploding. But now you want to do what doesn't come natural to dogs for most dogs, right? Coming into their space like a creeper, putting pressure on them and coming over the top. You have to understand, guys, yeah, there are dogs you could do anything to. A lot of labs and golden retrievers are so social. They break all the rules for most dogs. They don't care what you do to them. They don't care. But the majority of dogs, when you go straight to them, that's not good for a dog. Then you want to get low and do weird baby talk. Not good for a dog. Then you want to come over the top to them like this. Not good for a dog. You're telling that dog, I'm here to make you uncomfortable. That's what the dog sees and hears, right? Don't do it. Don't do it. Give your dog what they need and that space and respect, right? If your dog's worked that hard and changed that much, and I'm just using Sue as an example here because she has put in the work, right? And she's done wonderful. But even though now I know it's hard to tell family who's been doing so good, hey, now we just want to love on him. No, guys, he doesn't like that. And he will never like that. He'll never like that. No matter how well he does, chances are he will never like other people besides Sue and maybe her husband or, you know, whoever, like coming at him like that. And a lot of dogs don't. So when people ask me, hey, how should I approach a dog? Well, it's very easy. You don't. I don't approach dogs. And that's the difference between the working dog world and the pet dog world. When you go to, a, you know, an IGP trial or a Mondial ring trial or something, you don't see the other trainers and competitors going up to other competitors. Dogs. Oh, my God, he's so beautiful. Could I say hi? No. Because they have an education on what's best for the animal. They care about what's best for the animal. And a lot of those dogs are honest. And they're going to tell you when you come in to do that. Yeah, big mistake. They're going to let you know, big mistake, right? Sorry, shaking the table. But all those little things are vital, guys. And I could sit here for hours, hours and hours and give you one example after another. And a lot of, of the dogs that you have seen, right, have, that you have seen me working with. Why is it that when Emmy... The Great Dane, I showed a ton from her too, right? Me and Sophia picked up that Great Dane at the local airport. She flew in on a private jet. Literally, we're watching this private jet land with her sitting in a seat looking out the window. I'm like, this is hysterical, right? As soon as her owners left, that dog was in a harness. In a harness. Big, giant, powerful dog. That dog dragged me all over the parking lot to get back to her owners. We put her in the van and I drove her home. When I got her out, we started filming immediately. You can go back through YouTube and see all the videos. Immediately started filming. How long did it take her to start walking nicely on a loose leash next to me with a harness on? Not even a flat collar, not a prong collar. In minutes. Why? Why was that dog able to start walking with me? You know why? I stood at the end of my driveway and I think the video is called how training starts or something like that. And just like what you saw with the German short hair pointer, every time Emmy went away, I brought her back. She went away. I brought her back. That's what dogs are used to doing. 
They take their owners and they're all over. No interest in the owner. Head goes down, nose goes to the ground, and they're all over and the owner follows. You can't fix behavioral problems if you can't keep your dog still next to you, right? So when I do that, what's going to happen? One of two things. After a while, the dog will either sit down and look at me like, okay, you got me, or it will just lay down. When they do that, that's when I move forward. That's when the dog understands, okay, new sheriff in town. I guess I can't do what I normally do. You guys saw when I tried to get her to go on a place board. If you didn't, go watch it. Wouldn't go on a place board. Wouldn't go near, like deathly scared. Put on the brakes. Did I drag her on it? Did I nail an e-collar and pull her up and then release when she got on? That's what a lot of people do. Why would you pay someone three or $4,000 to do something you could do on your own when it's just force, right? I don't want to force her up there. I want her to do it on her own. I want her to think she's accomplishing things. So you saw what I did. I kept trying to do it slowly, gently, very gently. She's struggling. I went off to the side and did a couple of little things that she knows how to do easily. Let her get a win. Then we went back. Her first step was she jumped over the place board. Oh, my gosh, that's a great thing. I acted like an idiot. Oh, my God, look at you. You're a unicorn. And we celebrated like she just did something great. Well, guess what? She did. She did do something great. Yeah, she jumped over it. No big deal. At one point, she kicks it with her foot by accident, kicks the front of it. You know what I did? I celebrated that. I rewarded that. She touched it. But then... You saw it didn't take long where I get on the other side and I get that and I encourage her. You could do this, mama. You could do this. And very slowly she comes forward. Why did she come forward? Because she trusted me. I already had established that with her. She trusted me. And the second she got up there, I just hugged on her and she tucked her head in and the dogs will do that when they really, really like, Man, I appreciate you, and I feel better now. That head will get tucked, and it'll come into you, and that's where the affection comes. And then it was never a problem. That dog left here, couldn't walk on a leash, scared to death of everything, and left here biting on a bite sleeve. Full on doing bite work with that dog. That's how she left here. All because of the little things. Had nothing to do with the big shit, right? It's all those little things that people ignore. So I get a new dog here. I don't do any training per se. I can't believe I just did air quotes. Renzo, I just did air quotes. Don't ever let me do that again. I don't do any training per se, but I do. Again, training starts before the training starts. What's the first thing I teach every dog that comes here? A release command. Because most come here without a release command, right? Very important to me. Why? When someone brings their dog here, I don't take the dog, bring it inside and put it in the pen. I have the owners do that. Sometimes they're nervous. My dogs are out there. Sometimes they have a hard time for a few minutes, but never for long. I want my first interaction with the dog, and I'll usually do it 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. Depends on the dog and the time. My first interaction is going to be taking the dog out not putting the dog in, right? We're not going to do any training as far as come, sit down, place, you know, none of that stuff, but we are. I'm going to go to the door. I'm going to open the door. And when the dog, dog goes to go out, no, 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 I'm going to bring her back. And I'm not going to talk. I'm not going to talk. Then do it again. Then I'm going to just use spatial pressure. I'm not even going to use the leash. I want to stop that dog before it goes out the door, doing what it normally does, with just spatial pressure, nothing else. Not physically blocking the dog, not using the leash, not giving a command. I don't care if the dog sits down, stands, nothing. I want that dog to connect with me immediately and to figure out, I actually have to wait for this guy to move now. Very powerful, very powerful. And then I go out first and the dog follows. We get to the edge of the concrete and I stop. And I wait. And when the dog's waiting calmly, I say, free dog. 
and then I move and give the dog the end of the leash. It, it starts immediately with the free dog. Go be a dog, do your thing. And the dog is on leash. The dog's on a long line. For several days, all our movement is done on a long line, even in the fenced yard, because I'm going to control everything. But I'm also going to give that dog time to be a dog. Go sniff, go pee, go poop, do all the things you want when I say free dog. Then when I say, come on, let's go, now it's time to come back to me. And after two or three days of that, all dogs, I don't care how bad they are, start changing. And then when you go out to get them, you see the butt wiggling, you see the tail going, they're like, my dude is here. This is my dude. Like everything great comes through him. So then when training starts, it's effortless. It's effortless. Most dogs are very easy, very, very easy, right? But it's all done through those little things. So I thought when I saw all the comments and how much people appreciate that, that video with the German short hair pointer, which is horrible, like quality, like all my shit's horrible quality, right? But that's really bad quality, but I don't have good lighting where we start. I take the dog out of the crate, you know, and it's an old camera, an old iPhone, you know, it was like, like five or six years ago, but it's about the information and I want people to see. So people say, you know, you can't teach a dog to walk nicely that pulls that quick. Well, I'm going to show you. I'm not going to just tell you. I'm going to, it, it, it takes no effort if you understand how the dog sees things. And that's where we're failing. Okay, guys. Um, all the consultations that you guys are waiting for, I'm catching up on them. The private lessons you guys are waiting, I'm catching up on them. I'm going to start buckling down and going full force to try to get to everybody here. I don't want to blow anybody off, okay? So just please be patient. I have, like, everybody wanting the video consultations. And, you know, they've been going great. I, I didn't think that would work out. I wasn't big on doing it. People kind of forced me to do it. And it's been really beneficial. It really has. So as always, I appreciate you all more than you'll ever know for the constant, constant support for all these years. You know, I think uh, I think I put out my first video to try to do stuff like this, like 15 years ago, maybe like when the whole Internet thing first started with the dog stuff. And I think we're about, you know, I'm about to hit 13 million views on YouTube. And my shit is, is plain and boring and unprofessional as it gets. Still done with an iPhone, you know, but 13 million views. It's not the biggest channel out there and never will be. And I don't want to be and I won't try to be. But that's serious, serious support from so many of you from all over the world. So thank you. I do appreciate it very much. Okay. Um, all right, guys. We're right at an hour. I'm going to let you all go in this midday. Thanks for tuning in. If you have any questions, hit me up and uh, I'll see you all soon. Okay. Peace.